Hi, I'm Sandy. I'm the lead engineer on the open source Dagster project, and I work at Elemental, which is the company that builds Dagster and Dagster Cloud. I'm here to talk to you today about data pipelines. So if you're a data engineer, a data scientist, a machine learning engineer, et cetera, there's a good chance that one of the main things you spend your time on is building and maintaining data pipelines. What is a data pipeline? So first of all, a data pipeline normally culminates in a set of data assets. A data asset is a file, a machine learning model, a table, any persistent object that captures some understanding of the world. The point of building a data pipeline is usually to get a set of data assets that can be used to help make a business decision or power an application. To get to those assets, you're normally going to need to run some computations. So pull in data from external systems, transform it, do machine learning, you name it. Those computations are usually going to consume and produce other data assets. So those other data assets might be a source data, or they might capture some intermediate stage of the data transformation process. Uh, intermediate assets are often reusable uh, across a bunch of different analyses or applications, and they're also often what we inspect when we want to debug our data pipeline. As time passes and uh, your team gets bigger and you build more and more data assets, it's often useful to think about your data pipelines in terms of an organization-wide organization graph of data assets. It's kind of like a big supply chain. Data sources are the raw materials, which get used by downstream nodes that turn them into more valuable products, which finally get consumed by end users. And just like copper from a copper mine might get used both to mint pennies and to build electronics, a single data source can power dozens of data products. Uh, a single data product can also consume data from dozens of different sources, so it often doesn't make sense to um, chop this supply chain up into a bunch of uh, discrete flows. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. If you've built data pipelines before, you've probably at least heard of Apache Airflow. Airflow is a workflow engine, meaning it's a system that takes responsibility for executing a set of tasks in the right order. It was the first Python-based workflow engine that had a full web interface, and this gave it a lot of popularity. It's now probably the most commonly used tool for executing data pipelines. But first does not always mean best. Airflow is designed in a way that I believe makes it not actually a great fit for this task of building and maintaining data pipelines. The main reason is that it takes a very narrow view of data pipelines. So it schedules tasks, but it doesn't understand that tasks are built to produce and maintain data assets. And it focuses on discrete isolated workflows it doesn't model the fact that data pipelines typically represent a single organization-wide graph of data assets. Dagster is an orchestrator that takes a broader view. It was designed to assist with the holistic task of developing pipelines of data assets and evolving those pipelines over time. We believe uh, that taking this broader view can make data teams dramatically more productive and make data pipelines dramatically more reliable. So far, this is all pretty abstract. And so I'm going to spend the rest of this talk trying to be more specific about what I mean here. I'm going to show what it looks like to write a data pipeline using Dagster. And then I'm going to show what monitoring and scheduling look like when you think about your pipeline as a graph of data assets instead of a workflow. So the most common way to build a data pipeline in Dagster is to define a graph of data assets that you want to exist. Here's a basic example with three assets that uses Dagster's Python APIs. I don't expect you to read the implementations of these functions. The main piece to pay attention to is the function signatures. So each of these decorated functions defines a data asset that we want to exist um, and is part of our data pipeline. Up here at the top, we've got a data asset that's called country stats, which is a table of statistics on different countries around the world based on data that's pulled from Wikipedia. By default, it's going to correspond to a pickle file on local disk, uh, which is named country stats. But you can make it correspond to a table in S3, an ephemeral object in memory, whatever you want. The code inside the function is what we run. We want to materialize the asset. By materialize, I mean compute its contents and write them to storage. There's some fancy stuff that's going on here with separating business logic code from IO code. Um, the functions are returning data frames, you might have noticed. And some other code is writing those data frames out to the file system. Uh, Dagster doesn't require you to program in that pure functional way. Um, you can also handle the IO inside um, your function, but Dexter makes it easy to do so when you want to. So the second asset here 
is a regression model that's fit on the data inside country stats. The decorated function has an argument here, which is called country stats, um, that tells Dagster that it depends on this country stats asset. And that dependency is represented visually on the right. Last of all, we've got a third asset that depends on both of the assets that we just covered. Here's another graph of data assets, in this case, tables in Snowflake, uh, and it loads some data on orders and users from an application database, derives cleaner aggregated tables um, from those application database tables, and then uses those to forecast future orders. What's interesting about this graph uh, is that part of it is constructed in a slightly different way than the one that we saw on the last slide. Instead of defining assets directly in Python, we define them inside of a dbt project and loaded them from there. If you're not familiar with it, dbt is a framework that lets you define tables by writing SQL files, which each contain a select statement. Dexter doesn't model dbt as a black box. Uh, instead, it represents each dbt model as an asset in its graph. It's worth comparing the dbt section to how this would get represented in a workflow engine like Airflow that focuses only on tasks. Because Dagster focuses on data assets, um, it builds this granular understanding of the dbt DAG at the level of the individual models that each correspond to a data asset. Um, as a consequence, if there's a failure in the middle of running the dbt DAG, you can fix just that dbt model and then pick up where you left off. You can tell Dagster to materialize a particular dbt model and um, all of the assets that that model depends on, and it's not going to go and trigger unrelated tasks. In Airflow, you've just got a single box because you're typically running a single command um, to invoke dbt. Uh, and that means you execute the entire dbt DAG as a single unit. Um, you only have a coarse understanding of how it relates to the other assets in your pipeline. dbt is just one example of a tool that Dagster plays this way with. A lot of other modern data stack tools, such as Airbyte uh, or Fivetran, let you define assets that you want to exist, and Dagster can load from those tools uh, as well. Um, last of all, there are some situations where you just need to execute some computations in the right order. You don't want to think about data assets. Um, and in those cases, you can shed this entire asset way of looking at the world and use Dagster's underlying computational abstractions, which are called ops and jobs. If you're familiar with Airflow, they're rough analogs of tasks and DAGs. I'm not going to get into the details of how that works right now, but the point of this slide is just that Dagster doesn't force you to think in assets. Um, they're available when you need them. And if you're migrating code over from a task-based workflow engine, you don't need to shift your entire mental model to get stuff working. Uh, but back to Dagster's asset APIs, because that's the focus of this talk. Um, after we've written code to define a set of assets, we can launch a web server that points to that code. In the most simple setup, we just have to CD into the directory where that code lives and type Dagit. No processes related to Dagster need to be running on our laptop before doing this. Um, it's very lightweight. Um, and a quick reminder that everything I've shown you up to this point um, and for the rest of this talk is open source. So after running Dagit, we get the visual representation of our data pipeline that we saw earlier. At this point, it's just a set of tables that we expect to exist, but none are actually materialized in Snowflake yet. We can remedy that by clicking this materialize all button on the upper right. And that's going to launch a run that materializes the assets in the right order. If we click one of the assets, we can look at the metadata that was recorded as part of this materialization. So a materialization isn't just a record saying that a computation ran. It's also a description of the object that was produced by that computation. For example, here we chose to record the parameters and mean squared error of our forecasting model. Once we've deployed our pipeline of production, we want to be able to understand and communicate what it's doing. And we want to be able to find out if there are problems and fix them. This is an error, uh, area where the focus on uh, assets really shines. Uh, if there's a problem in production, we're often going to learn about it because someone tried to use a data asset, and that asset doesn't look like they expected it to. Um, many of the common questions that we have when operating and monitoring our data pipelines involve assets. So we want to know whether an asset is up to date, um, what needs to be run uh, to refresh the asset, um, when the asset is going to be updated next, uh, what code and data were actually used to generate the asset. Dagster hosts a page for each data asset. And anyone who cares about an asset can find it and learn about it. So here's the page for the order predictions table that we looked at earlier. In addition to information about the last time 
that we materialize the table. Um, this page also includes metadata that we've recorded, like how many rows it has, evaluation for the model, met metrics for the model, et cetera. Um, if we think it has stale data, we can see the most recent time that it was updated. And if it's out of date, we can hit this materialize, materialize button to, um, uh, uh, to refresh it immediately. Often, an asset's problems stem from assets that it depends on, which are further up in the graph. So from the page that we were just on, we can go to the lineage tab and see all the assets that this asset depends on. Unlike with a workflow engine, this lineage is based on data dependencies, not execution dependencies. That means that even if the predicted orders table doesn't get refreshed on the same schedule as the users table, we can still trace the lineage between them. So this lets us go very deep to find problems. And it's not just about tracing lineage. Even if the predicted orders table and the users table are updated, updated at different cadences, we can kick off an ad hoc run that includes both of them. Um, so for example, if it's really important that predicted orders gets the most up-to-date data, we could kick off a run that materializes it and all of its dependencies at once. Manually materializing assets is useful, especially when we're developing, but uh, we can't stop there. Um, we can't stop there because assets are constantly changing. New upstream data is constantly arriving, and we're constantly changing the code that derives our assets from that upstream data. The result is that our asset materializations naturally drift from their definitions over time. Um, when that drift occurs, we need to launch computations to bring those materializations in line with their definitions. And launching computations is typically the job of an orchestrator. When we shift our perspective to think about scheduling and orchestration from the perspective of data assets, it starts to look a little bit different. Managing change in data assets boils down to a few basic elements. Uh, first of all, to compute our data assets, we typically run code. When that code changes, we eventually want to update our data assets to reflect the new logic. We derive our data assets from upstream data. So our code executes on upstream data to produce our data assets. Um, and when that upstream data changes or grows, we eventually um, want to update our assets to incorporate those. Last of all, depending on how our data assets are used, we'll have different requirements for how up-to-date they need to be. If we're able to express our intentions to the orchestrator directly in these terms, then the orchestrator can do a really faithful job at scheduling materializations at the time we need them and avoid doing unnecessary work when we don't need it to. But most, or but most orchestration tools don't actually think in these terms. Um, they instead require thinking in imperative workflows, sequences of tasks that run together on fixed schedules. This imperative workflow model has some big frictions. So for one, it makes it hard to express what should happen in some common situations. For example, let's say we've got two tables that depend on the same upstream table. For one of these tables, we want to incorporate events within an hour of when they occur. For the other one, it's more expensive to compute, and we only care about it being up to date daily. If we want to schedule this pretty basic graph uh, with workflows, it gets pretty awkward fast. So one option would be to try to do it with two overlapping workflows, um, one that we schedule hourly and one that we schedule daily. But sometimes these workflows will run at the same time and will redundantly update that upstream table twice when we only need to do it once. Or alternatively, we could have an hourly workflow that includes uh, the fact table and then a daily workflow that doesn't. Um, but if we want to do this, then we might need to find a way to make sure that the daily workflow waits for part of the hourly workflow to complete. Otherwise, it might get stuck with yesterday's, yesterday's data. So we end up needing to have some sort of fancy conditional uh, logic that bridges between these different workflows. Um, third, we could try putting them all together into one big workflow. Uh, in that case, we would need some special conditional logic within our workflow to make sure that the daily table only runs some of the time. Um, among other reasons, this is weird because now our orchestrator can't actually tell us that the daily table is daily. Um, it's part of this hourly workflow. And we get a bunch of empty boxes um, for when it didn't run. As a quick side note, I've personally tried all of these approaches at different times. Um, 
And they have their pros and cons, but ultimately I think they're all pretty unsatisfying. And that's just one of the patterns that are awkward to express. Um, you've got other ones like this, where a daily table depends on an hourly table. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the different ways to handle this one with workflows, but I hope you get to the point. I hope you get the point um, on the difficulties of expressing these. A second related friction with imperative workflow-based orchestration is that every time you add an asset, you have to find a DAG to put it in to get it scheduled. Uh, this means you have to worry about whether DAGs are getting too large and unwieldy on one extreme or too small and fragmented on the other. And then last of all, um, you get alerted when your task fails, not when your data is out of date, which is often what you actually care about. If the system can retry and self-correct before the deadline, then nobody needs to get paged. So how does this look different when you think about scheduling from the asset perspective? Well, in Dagster, you can schedule assets to be materialized using workflows like other tools allow. Um, but you can alternatively uh, use uh, this option called freshness policies. The idea behind freshness policies is that you don't think in workflows at all and that you instead directly specify how up to date you expect each of your assets to be. Then Dagster will use those policies as constraints to determine when asset materializations need to be scheduled. Here's what the code looks like. So we've got the two aggregation assets that both depend on the same fact table, just like we saw in the diagrams before. The first one has a freshness policy that says it should never be more than an hour out of date. And the second one has a freshness policy that says it should never be more than a day out of date. Dagster will automatically schedule materializations of our assets so that they meet their freshness policies. It'll avoid duplicating work when two assets depend on the same upstream asset. So it knows that the same materialization of the fact table can be used to help both of these downstream assets meet their freshness policies. And then of course these freshness policies are represented when we're viewing our asset um, in Dexter's web UI so we can understand um, uh, what, they're supposed to, what they're supposed to be doing um, and whether, when they're violating their SLAs. So that was freshness policies. Uh, jumping back to this slide from before, we talked about this guy on the top uh, right. If our code always stays the same and our upstream data is changing constantly, then thinking in terms of freshness policies is enough. But if we sometimes change our code or if our upstream data isn't changing constantly, then we have the opportunity to go even a little further to keep our assets up to date in a principled and organized way. We face a couple of challenges in these situations. One is that we forget to update assets that are stale. So maybe we push a change to our code uh, that generates a table or a machine learning model, but we forget to actually run that code and update it and all of its downstream assets. So our assets end up stale. Uh, or conversely, we run our code too often, and that code ends up just overwriting our assets with the exact uh, same contents. Um, this is wasteful of time and resources. Ideally, we would have a reliable way uh, of tracking which assets are stale. Um, um, and we would only spend resources updating those stale assets. When we say an asset is stale, we mean that its um, code or its upstream data has changed. So Dagster offers a way to handle this through a granular asset versioning system. The idea is that users assign fine-grained versions to code and to upstream data. And Dagster then uses them to determine which assets are stale and thus might need to be rematerialized. So to demonstrate how this works, here's a small graph of software-defined assets. It starts with some data on common breakfast cereals and then transforms that data to derive some insights. Each of these software-defined assets has been given a code version. Um, and that code version represents the version of the function that computes the asset. The contract is that as long as the function returns the same outputs when provided the same inputs, its version can stay the same. So now imagine we'd like to make a change to the code that represents this Nabisco serials asset at the top. Maybe we're fixing a bug that's causing it to be missing some records. Uh, we change our code and then we bump the corresponding version to indicate that the code has changed. When this new code gets deployed, Dexter can tell us that some of our assets are now stale. The asset that we bumped the version on is marked stale, and any assets downstream are also marked stale because their contents would also change 
if they were rematerialized. We can remedy the fact that these are stale by kicking off a run that materializes just the stale assets. Changing code isn't the only way the assets can become stale. Um, source data can also change. So if we use Dagster source assets to represent upstream data that our pipeline depends on, we can then use versions to track when that upstream data changes. Here is a source asset that corresponds to a file on our file system. Uh, we version this source, source asset by writing a observation function, which looks at the file uh, and returns a value representing its version. In this case, we look at the last modified timestamp of the file and use that last modified timestamp as the version. Um, alternatively, we could have taken a hash of the contents of the file if it's small enough and used that as the version. Um, Dagster can then call this function to determine whether our source assets version has changed. And if it has, then downstream assets are considered stale. So that's what I have for you today. Uh, I wanna sum up everything that we talked about here. First, data pipelines are graphs of data assets, like files, tables, and machine learning, and machine learning models connected by computations. Workflows are not an adequate metaphor for data pipelines because workflows focus on tasks, not data assets. And because breaking up a data supply chain into isolated DAGs is awkward and unrealistic. Dagster was designed directly for orchestrating data pipelines. It focuses on keeping data assets up to date, not just on workflows of tasks. Um, it has freshness policies, which let you schedule without carving your asset graph into workflows and uh, while thinking more directly about the requirements you have for your data assets being up to date. And granular versioning lets you execute only what has changed. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can check us out on GitHub, um, which I think you can get to with a link in the chat or just by Googling Dags for GitHub. And we'd love to see you in our Slack if you have any questions um, or just want to chat, um, which you can get to from our website, dagster.io. Thank you.